I'm Chris Conacher, the founder of ComputerAudioFile.com, and this is the Computer Audio Q&A session um, where you can ask anything you want, and if I can answer, I'll answer. If I can't, you know, so be it. Um, I don't consider myself an expert at anything, so um, let's see here. So just a real quick, a little bit about my background. Um, I was born an audiophile, like a lot of the people uh, I've met here, and my work experiences, enterprise information technology. And in 2007, I wanted to start using a music server because I was finally ready. I thought the quality was good. Um, and I looked around the internet for information and it was spotty. I couldn't find what I wanted. So I started my own site called computeraudiofile.com. And it's really, really taken off from there. And this, to me, it's like the funnest time ever to be an audiophile. And this side of the industry has really, really taken off. Um, it's just, it's really fun. And if you can think of it, it can be done. Uh, sometimes it's just not that easy. So um, let's see here. So this is all questions. And I have Windows and, and my Mac here. So if people want to see how to do things, I'll just show you right here. Um, and let's just get rolling. So anybody got questions? Uh, right, yep. Right Okay, so the question, if people aren't familiar, um, every 18 months or so, I just uh, publish kind of like a computer design that people could build themselves or purchase um, the exact same server that I'm using. Um, and so I'll design this, publish it, and it's got some specific parts in there that I like for computer audio. Um, and the question is, what if I put those parts in just a normal computer? Uh, am I going to get the same sound or you know, what the difference is. And uh, the term normal computer uh, is, is, is pretty vague. I wouldn't, I haven't tried it, but I just, I wouldn't do it. Um, just partly, I mean, like the noise factor from, say, a Dell somebody orders, they're built to a price point as cheap as they can get. Um, and, you know, that's what they do. Whereas the CAPS server has, um, the external power supply, totally fanless design. Um, and I don't make any money off this server, so I'm talking it up. Um, so don't think I'm pushing anything here. Um, so I just think the dedicated computer for computer audio is where to go. And, but that said, you could probably put the components in another computer and be totally happy. So, you know, there's really no one answer for any of this, no best answer either. So, yes? So, so taking this a step further, so this is one approach that, you know, like Microsoft tried to get into media servers, but another approach now is doing NAS, streaming applications and associated hardware, and plugging that into your dedicated system. So is, talk, maybe talk to us about this approach versus that approach. Okay, so the question is kind of, uh, talk about the different approaches, like say a CAP server, or I think you were talking like a NAS or streaming solution. So there's several different ways to go. The, the CAP server, I also use it as a streaming solution as well. So I store all my music um, on a NAS server, network attached storage. It has 16 terabytes of music and that sits in the back room at my house. Um, so it's, it's loud, but I can't hear it near my listening room. So, and I'll use, say, J River Media Center here and pull the music from the NAS. Um, and I'll be able to send that. If I want to do the streaming route via Ethernet, I can just send it via Ethernet right through J River. Um, and then I'm not sure, you know, sometimes you can go straight from your NAS to the playback device. Um, and there's a couple ways to do that too is like the Synology NAS is you can plug a USB cable in and go right to a NAS and they'll output right to it. Um, it's kind of cool, but the user interface, I think, stinks. Um, like, for computer audio, I, I want the whole experience. I want cover art. I want everything that's possible, and it's really cool. So if I have to, like, look at a spreadsheet to select my music, that's not my thing. Um, a lot of people love it, but I'm more for the full experience. So streaming off a of NAS is an awesome way to do it. 
Um, do you have any more like specifics with that question? I think you're going somewhere. I can drill down a little bit. So, so you know, I think for some of us that aren't in IT, the, the prospect of building uh, servers a little bit daunting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, another route, now, granted, you can stream with this, but I guess to be more specific, I was trying to avoid names, but going from a, a NAS to, let's say, AirPlay. So, you know, there are some advantages and disadvantages. Are you seeing some sound quality advantages? going from the ground up and building bespoke equipment for your solution versus doing a lot of plug and play uh, Apple-based hardware? Oh, oh, I use the Apple-based hardware as well. I use everything. Um, I use Macs, I use this new Mac, Retina display, love it. Um, have Windows servers, Linux-based servers. Neither, none of them are always better than the other one. So. I always tell people, because a lot of audio is like, what route should I go, Mac or Windows? And they've never heard of Linux before. And I'm just like, whatever you're comfortable using, just go with it. You know, If you like Mac and somebody tells you to get a PC because it's better, you're not really going to get into it. Um, so whatever people want to use, you can get it to work. And the thing, you know, I mentioned Linux servers. Um, for the Linux servers, you don't even have to know that they're Linux servers. Um, so they work like a toaster. Throw the CD in, it rips it and spits it out. Connect it via USB or something right to your DAC, and you have a nice iPad interface, and that's it. So it's all you know what what the experience you want. So way in the back. Just a general comment. There may be one or two other people like me, total newbies to this idea. If you can weave in a little bit of. Uh, explanation of terms that you're using, like NAS is, was one, and I mean, I know you can't stop your stream of talk and define everything, but just... Uh, Certainly, yeah, yeah, because yeah, if chances are if you have a question, so do 10 other people here, so any questions, you know, are up. Sure, NAS is Network Attached Storage. So what's really cool about Network Attached Storage is most of them hold I mean, it's a box, say, this size, and it holds, mine happens to hold eight hard drives. You can get them that hold from one to however many you want, and it sits in the back room and it connects via Ethernet cable to my network switch in my house. So I can access that from any computer in my house, and it's, the drives are replaceable. If one dies, I take it out, put a new one in, and nothing happens. I don't lose any data. And it's, also, NAS drives, it's cool because most of them now are upgradable. So if I put in two terabyte drives, if I want to put in four terabyte drives, if I do it the way the manufacturer says to do it, pull out one drive, put a four terabyte drive in, you'll take advantage of the new uh, capacity. So that's network attached storage in uh, kind of layman's terms. Is that kind of an explanation that helps or? OK. Yes? That's more bigger, how expensive. Uh, prices on NAS, kind of like high-end audio, uh, can be fairly inexpensive to however many millions you want to spend, enterprise. So you could probably get one with a couple drives for 400 bucks, maybe, um, and then probably cheaper than that. Uh, I like Synology NASs. I've been using them for a couple years. They have a really, really good interface. Uh, S-Y-N-O-L-O-G-Y, I believe. Um, so I might as well just go out there. And it's a very easy to use product. You don't have to really know about setting things up. Because, I mean, back in the day, you got a NAS and put five hard drives in. You had to think about RAID, redundant array of independent disks, and what kind of, what do you want to do with that? So now, you plug in the Synology unit, and it just guides you through it. You don't have to know anything. Because really, what most of us want to do is store our music there and then listen to our music. We don't want to become IT experts. So you know, I'm in, I'm in the same boat. I, when I want to do this, I want to listen to my music. Granted, I love the IT part of it, but that's just that's kind of another side of it. So that, I mean, say start at 300, 400 bucks, and you can go all the way up to however much you want to spend. So you just talked about the well first of all I gotta thank you for being so patient with your website. So oh you, thank, thank you, thank you. It's good to hear. And I just imagine 
you know, the, the blood must pop out of your forehead. <laughs> and, and the emails that people like to send that aren't pleasant. <laughs> it's surprising. So thank you very much. Yeah, but my question is, you talked about the full experience, being able to look at the album art. And recently, you just talked about J Remote that goes on an iPad yes. that is wonderful for, with Windows. Yeah. OK, I'm an iMac guy. Yeah. What, what, what's the best experience I can get? So the best experience remote, yeah. meaning? OK. Um, so I'll kind of cover both of those. So as I said, I'm the, into the full experience. I want Elmar. I want everything. Um, and I don't want it to affect sound quality either. So um, when I use J, I use J River on Windows. Um, and I use an app called J Remote. And to me, I actually just have a, uh, I just wrote a review on it. And there's some screenshots up here. To me, it's absolutely a stunning interface. Yeah, yeah, hey, I hear you. So to me, J Remote's a stunning interface on the iPad. Swipe, it, I mean, it's just so cool. <laughs> it's hard to explain. Um, so the question is, well, how do I get that on Mac? Or can I get something like that? Or what's the deal? So right now, the Apple free application, Remote, just called Remote quite clever. Um, that is as close as you're going to get with iTunes. It works fairly well. Um, it, it's, it's, it's kind of annoying to, you know, like on the fly here, I'll go to another album, press and hold. It'll come up with a menu. Um, I probably have a screenshot of that somewhere. Don't, who set this website up? Um, <laughs> it's all me. <laughs> okay, so yeah, press and hold on uh, an album here, and then I get all these options. I'll play next, play now, clear playlist, whatever I want to do. You can't do that right now with remote on iTunes, but the next version of iTunes, they are tweaking it a little bit, but who knows? I doubt it's going to be as good as this. Um, but if if you want, you know, the user interface is very, very important to me and a lot of people. You know, that's your interface to your music. And if it allows you to get closer to your music and listen more, that's what it's all about, you know. So, and then one other thing I will mention is J River is working on a version for Mac. So if you want to wait, eventually you could run J River on Mac and J Remote or J River's own Gizmo application? Matt? Yeah, I mean, we hope to have an audio-only one. I'm Matt from J River. Uh, <laughs> uh, we hope to have a, an audio-only one at the end of the year. End of the year? Hopefully. It'll probably be, like all software, it'll be rough. But yeah, a lot of people are excited about that. How about an audio-only for the PC? Hmm, sounds like something other people well, you can are turn features on, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can turn video off and images. <laughs> yeah, that's actually what I do. Uh, I go into J River and turn off a lot of features to kind of turn it into audio only. Um, like, I'll go in here and turn off a lot of things. This isn't the normal PC I use all the time, so these, these are all enabled. But... Um, like, I don't need a lot of these things, so I shut them off, or I'll shut off video, or whatever. But that's an option. So, I don't know if you have a comment. Yesterday, Gordon Rankin was saying that it's much easier to set up a Mac system if you're just starting over. Um, so yesterday, yeah, Gordon, if you guys were here, Gordon from Wavelength Audio says it's much easier, much easier to set up a Mac system. And I don't completely agree. It's much easier to set up the system you're familiar with. So, you know, like, my parents, 60 years old, used to PCs. If I told them to set up a Mac system, that's rocket science. So it's all really what you're used to. And you know, Windows gets a bad rap. Um, I think it's, it's getting better every single release, although Windows 8 is going to be a little bit tough with the interface changes. Um, but Windows 7, you set it up once, and that's it. It just runs, like the CAP server. That thing, that'll run for a month until I need to reboot it for some reason unrelated to anything, but it's because I'm goofing around. So, you know, 
don't be scared off from Windows systems because people say, you know, Mac is easier, Mac's more stable. For a, for a music server, it works spectacular. Super basic question for Mac. Uh, the latest Mac Mini doesn't have an optical drive. Can you attach an external one? Oh yeah, yeah. The latest Mac Mini doesn't come with an optical drive. Neither does this Mac laptop. So just you can get the Mac Super Drive. Seems to work very well. They just took what was internal. Yeah, yeah. Or get something like this, a little Blu-ray drive. I have a seminar tomorrow on how to rip Blu-rays and rip DVD audios um, on Mac and Windows. So yes, back there. Uh, two questions. Have you used JPlay with JRiver? What's your experience been? You know, it's a good question. Have I used JPlay with JRiver? I haven't. Um, but a lot of my readers do use it and like it. Some have tried it and think, well, it's not very stable. Uh, if it, it'll make the app crash or something will crash. And for the geeks in the room who don't mind that stuff, you know, great, go for it. It's, you know. What does it do? Uh, better just going to the JPlay site and reading about it. Um, it minimizes the number of resources that you use. Yeah, it, they, they say it does a lot of things to yeah, min minimize resources. And it's just not something I've been too interested in. Um, but that's just me, you know. So um, yeah, I haven't played with a follow-up. One other question, yeah. Have you played with the USB SPDF converters at all? Question, have I played with USB to SPDIF converters? Oh yeah, yeah. I have I have reviews of them. I have a couple in now. They can work awesome. Um, they they come in really really handy for people that have a great DAC at home without a USB input, or have a CD player, SA CD player that's got digital input, and you don't want to replace you know your what you invested in. So just get a USB to SPDIF converter, plug it into your computer, and you're going. You know some of them are very very good. Some of them are very, very inexpensive. Um, not the height of living, but it's a start, you know? Um, like, I just borrowed this one from Steve from AudioQuest, the Dragonfly, just so I could show people if you want to know how to configure a DAC. I mean, here's the USB DAC, analog output. It's great. So, all right, who's up in the back? I have a question about your CAS server. Sure. Um, First, I've seen a version 2.1. I was curious as to whether you came up with specs for that. Sure, sure. So version 2.1 um, was, I didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, Andrew from Small Green Computer had requests for a more powerful version. So he just kind of, uh, he did some research and then offered, you know, what he calls CAPS 2.1. So, but right now I'm working on version 3. And there'll probably be three different versions of version 3 and some different options you can do with them. No comment. <laughs> what's that? Can you give any preview of what some of the improvements with the version 3 right now? Not yet. I, I have one full system at home and I have probably two systems worth of parts sitting on the front step <laughs> from Amazon. Um, so it's, it's not fully... Uh, I don't want to bring it up yet because it'll probably change like three times, but that's kind of my plan. Yes, Any chance you'll build and sell them? Any chance I'll build and sell them? Um, probably not. Uh, I, would, I would like to, but I don't know. It's kind of hard for me to recommend a server on my website that I built and that I sell. It's just as like, okay, I got another, re another server into review and it's hard to be impartial. So and you'll authorize Small Green to build it? Yeah, yeah. Yep, exactly. And I don't get a penny off anything they sell. It's just more of a... <laughs> no, no, no. Then I couldn't talk, uh, you know, unbiased. So, yes. Do you uh, know of any uh, control programs that work on Android devices? To control what? Your audio. In other words, use an Android device as opposed to the iPad. Yes. So what application would you like to control? Okay, so for the question is, what about Android devices and remote control? Yes, for Jay River, um, they wrote their own Android app called Gizmo. Works great. 
for, I don't know, I mean, there's, there's probably one for iTunes on a Mac. I just haven't seen it and haven't really looked for it. So, but I'll never say it's never there because somebody's done it. Yes? I download all my music uh, on the hard drives with um, WAV files and I use directories and subdirectories and so on and so forth. I don't like uh, loading up album covers because there are a lot of times when I like just one or two uh, songs from those. Um, is there any remote control and software that would work good for, say, a good and high-end uh, silent um, music server uh, that I could use in my seat and, and control the directories and subdirectories and pick out the songs that way? Ah, so browse via files, kind of, for lack of a better term, the old school way, yeah. browsing through like Explorer and, and that. Um, I'm not sure if JRemote will do that. I wouldn't be surprised if it does. Um, let's see. Okay. So it's totally, totally, you can, it's totally. Okay, yeah, JRemote can do it. Um, so I believe Goodwins has now switched to JRiver. Um, and JRemote on iOS, you can customize it and allow you to browse the, the directories the way you like. Um, what's that? Uh, for J Remote, I like the iPad, or the iPhone app is also great, or an iPod Touch. That's that's the route I would go. J Okay, if you're talking about typing stuff in and editing anything or metadata or whatever, yeah, the iPad is not for that. that that'll that take you forever. But when you just want to sit down and listen to your music and browse your collection and have a good time, total iPad. It's, better, it's actually, I prefer that instead of like remote controlling in to my music server because then I get on to other things. I'll, I'll start, oh, I want to edit that metadata. I misspelled something. It's like, eh, not for me. So. Yes, sir. Uh, you brought up uh, Windows 8 and the changes that were coming in the interface. And I had asked this at the uh, seminar yesterday and, and uh, wanted to find out if there are changes in Windows 8 that would affect uh, our music or quality or ease of setup. Sure. So the question is about Windows 8. Uh, the changes, are they going to affect our music quality setup? Or, you know, what's Windows 8 going to do to us? <laughs> So I've been using Windows 8 for a little while. The user interface, when it starts up, is way different. The start button's gone, and it's just like, oh gosh, this is, you know, why? Um, I just, I just want to use it for a music server, you know? So, but in terms of, uh, as a music server, so far it's worked great for me. I haven't had any, like, oh, this sounds like crap moments. Um, so I'm running J River version 18 on Windows 8, and it's, so far it's worked pretty good. I, it's just the user interface is bugging the heck out of me. But you know, it's like one of those things. Get it set up, let it run, and just use an iPad, Android device, then you don't got to worry about it for remote control. So <laughs> not that I've been able to tell so far. Related question, have you run any, uh, any issues with Backwards driver compatibility with hardware? Is that, that's uh, the issues that the question is, you know, backwards compatibility with hardware and drivers. Windows Seven drivers. Yes. So the a lot of the USB DACs I'm using, um, you will use a driver from a company called like Thysicon, and so you got to install that to go over 2496, just because Windows hasn't supported Class Two USB audio natively like Mac. So. Those drivers, so far, you go to install them, and it will say, oh, this driver's for Windows 7, Windows XP, you know, every other version except Windows 8. Um, but you can just use compatibility mode, and everything installs works just fine. So two ways to do that, too, is you can right-click it, say compatibility mode, Windows 7, you're done. And but once you do that, if you go to uninstall, you'll get that same message of the uninstall. You can't do it because it's for Windows 7. You should browse to the, there's a folder, uninstall.exe, or a file. Do the same thing, compatibility mode for that, and then it works just fine. So small quirks. 
Uh, EMM Labs updated their driver for their DAX, and that works with Windows 8 fine. So, but I haven't run into anything other than the install problems. So my Berkeley Alpha USB works just fine with the same driver that worked on Windows 7. So no real issues. Yes? Question about uh, high def audio, HD tracks, et cetera. One of the advantages of computer audio is the format, so you can quickly go from Red Book to whatever. What's your summary at this point on the state of high definition or high resolution audio versus Red Book? I mean, your own experience, because there still seems to be so much controversy around how it's being implemented. Is it really high definition when it's something that was recorded in the 70s? Do you have a feel for that at this point? I do, I do. Um, yeah, there's people with vested interests um, saying, here's my definition, here's my definition of high resolution audio and whatever. But the way I look at it is, it's much more about the people involved in making the recording than it is about the resolution. So 24192 from Joe Sixpack in his garage doing the recording is gonna be terrible. It just is, you know, Keith Johnson reference recordings doing AM radio or something, it's gonna sound much better. So that's the kind of way, that's the way I look at it. And a lot of people like to do an AB between, oh, is 24192 better than 441? So they get the version, that version of both versions on their computer and they play them back and forth and they can't hear a difference. And it's, it's really, really hard to do that type of comparison apples to apples because chances are very high that your DAC operates differently at both sample rates. The specs will change on it and what it can do. So right there, the experiment's kind of blown. Um, and what was the native format of the recording? Was it done at 88.2 so they could make a 44.1 version easily? And they just upsampled to 192. You know, there's so many variables. It just comes down to, you know, hopefully one person will download it, start talking about it, and oh, yeah, I think I want to get that. You know, sometimes you have to be the guinea pig and download it. If it's great, it's great. If not, well, you only blew 15 bucks. And in this hobby, the sales tax on cables is drastically more. <laughs> so, you know. Yes. Just a follow on question to that. I really appreciate the forum that you set up where people can uh, basically upload their audacity plots for yep. all their the music that they've purchased. Any plans or thoughts around maybe organizing that a little bit better into a database where you could actually do searches and stuff? Yeah. Oh yes, there's thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I. Yeah, so what he's talking about is. Uh, oh, that's an interesting title. Awesome as. Okay, Frank. Yeah. Um, so let me pull up one. Uh, Patricia Barber Blu-ray attached thumbnails. So what people are doing is you know downloading, ripping, and then uploading the uh, analysis of it through software, and the analysis doesn't tell you everything. It can tell you a small piece of what's going on. Um, so yeah, I would love to have it organized, awesome, but uh, limited time, you know how it goes. Um, somewhat bigger fish to fry, but yeah, I would love to do it. So if you're willing to do it, let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I kind of a related question to the, to the prior two. Has there been any talk in the industry about a new universal standard for music that's the successor to Red Book, 16? No. Nope. Well, I won't say there's been no talk. I'm sure somebody's talking about it. And I, I mean, I've heard a couple companies talk about, you know, the one single file format that's going to do everything for everybody. Nobody's jumping on that bandwagon. I mean, it's just everybody's got other things to do. Who's got the time and money to do that for us, you know? So, not gonna happen in my view. Well, speaking yes. of formats, what, what do you know about Pono uh, that Neil Young is? Nothing. I know nothing about Pono. Next, yes. I believe you said at one point you were looking at ASUS external DAC. Yes. But I never saw a report. Can you, can you help me on that? You sound like somebody from the company. <laughs> so yeah, I, I have a, an Asus external DAC headphone amplifier um, in for review. I think it's called the Essence One, uh, and it's still sitting on my desk at home. A review is planned. Yes, I've had it for a long time, but 
that doesn't have anything to do with the performance or anything like that. I just haven't got around to it. So yeah, the review is planned. One thing that's cool about that device is um, you can do USB out with the camera kit from an iPad because the USB is powered not from the uh, iPad. So if it's more than five volts, that thing, it doesn't care. So one thing I found out in my limited time with it. So yep, that's coming. Yes? I am brand new to all this computer uh, audio. Okay. All right. I've got like 2,000 CDs. I want to start ripping them. Yeah. All right. So when I'm talking around, it sounds like a little mini is a good place to start. And then uh, just use their optical drive, whatever they sell, did you say it a second ago? Uh, sure. Mac Store sells the Super Drive, I think they call it. Oh, yeah, yeah, very good. Versus Toshibus or others that are out there. Yeah. Okay. So, do I need to buy any of this, get any software uh, like Pure to do that? Or how do I go about, what's the best way to start ripping all my music? Okay, so you're in the same boat as a lot of other people. Yeah, I'm brand new with it. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> you, just, you just asked the question. Everyone else is wondering it. So, he's just starting, um, got a couple thousand CDs probably going to get a Mac Mini and wants to rip the CDs. Does he need to purchase any more software? Or what, what's the deal? So, and, then, and there's codecs involved. Codecs involved. You know, everything. You just need to know a small piece of what's possible. Otherwise, you'd be totally lost. You know, the more, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. So just focus on the little piece you need to know, and it'll be a blast for you. So yeah, pick up a Mac Mini. Use, are your CDs in fairly good shape? Like you didn't use them as beer coasters in college? Okay, to you're totally set then. Okay, you're totally set then. <laughs> so just open up iTunes, use error correction. Yeah, it's just, yeah, in fact, let's just uh, do that. Same process from the PC? Yeah, the same process for the PC if you're using iTunes. So in iTunes, there's, this is just preferences, general. First tab that comes up is import settings. So you click on here, and this is what's going to happen when you put a CD in to rip it. So this one is selected Apple Lossless, which is now an open source codec, which is a great thing. Um, and there's the use error correction. Done and done. So. But then you need to drive the store all this stuff on tip. Yeah. Okay, now. Or get a Mac Mini with a big, well, you have 2,000 CDs, so yeah, you're going to need external storage. Okay, yes. You need at least a terabyte or something or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, there's various drives out there. You've got 5,400, 7,200, and now you've got the solid states. Yep. What's the best way to go on that? No best way. I can just tell you the, what I've done and what I like to do. Um, I like the NAS route, network attached storage. But a lot of people, that just kind of scares them off right away. I got to hook it up to my network and what? So, you know, it's like. Because it's going to be dedicated just for my stereo. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what I would do, just pick up a FireWire hard drive. What kind of DAC are you going to use? USB, FireWire, Ethernet, any idea? Um, I'm not sure yet because I have more learning about that. Right now I'm trying to, but I guess that comes hand in hand. Yeah, because what you don't want to output the audio from your Mac Mini, it's like analog out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, chances are that you'll get a USB DAC to connect to that, or you'll use a USB to SP to converter. It'll be USB out. There's very few FireWire outs right now, kind of going away. So if you get it. Well, how come Apple won't upgrade to uh, uh, USB 3 or They so? have. This laptop has USB 3. <laughs> it's part of the job. <laughs> yeah. Because all they have is, I think, the, well, they have their, uh, uh, what's their proprietary? Uh, uh, Thunderbolt. Yeah. And, so, and there's hardly anyone dealing with Thunderbolt. Yeah. There's and smart drives. I know uh, this company out of California, I've got the mail, uh, make sure it's good drives, and, uh, but it's very expensive. Yeah. So here's where I'm going. You're probably going to get a USB audio device to connect to the mini, I would get a FireWire hard drive. Yeah, get a FireWire 800 hard drive. The only thing I hate about that is the cable and the connector. 
they should have a locking connector. If anybody's plugged that into the back of the Mini, you, you know what I'm talking about. It comes out so easily. But What about just starting with the USB 2 then? Okay, so if you're using a USB audio device like a DAC, you don't want to use a USB hard drive. Just, just know that. That's kind of a, uh, on I don't want to say uncontested because I'm sure some people will contest that, but that's kind of how everyone's doing it. So no USB to USB. So far wire coming out into a USB uh, DAC is fine? Then, no, 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 no. USB DAC, just yeah. plug the DAC in USB straight out, and then just get a FireWire hard drive. You can get a Thunderbolt hard drive, but right now, I kind of think they suck, um, just to be blunt. A lot of them aren't like as fast as Thunderbolt should be. Um, there's kind of some half-ass implementations. Like, okay, we'll have a Thunderbolt connector. Internally, we'll just kind of convert it to, you know, SATA 2. So, to me, I'm skipping Thunderbolt hard drives right now. Um, so I would go Mac Mini, USB audio device, FireWire hard drive, and that is a very simple solution. And it's capable of great performance. Yeah. Uh, so uh, as far as Apple also, that's what I got to use. And no, you don't have there's to. There's other stuff that's out there, like Pure and JRiver and uh, Armada, whatever it's called. <laughs> <laughs> you don't got to do anything. I've been doing a little on work there, but I'm trying to ah. put it all together. Okay? Now, that's only for playback, though, huh? Yeah, so getting the CDs in, the only... Okay, so there's five choices here for ripping. AAC, AFF, Apple Lossless, MP3, or Wave. And I rule out a few of them just because they don't, I mean, I rule out MP3 and AAC because they're lossy. Just, okay, fine. Um, I rule out Wave because it doesn't support, okay, it supports metadata, but not really. So you can get applications that will kind of read it and do album art, and if you want to get geeky, um, you can get album art in there, and you can get it to work, um, but Flack. Apple uh, doesn't support Flack in iTunes unless you use a really geeky plugin, so it's a road I wouldn't go. So I would do Apple Lossless or AIFF. Okay. That's the two I would use. Do anything you want, but I'm just, you know. So, but on playback, though, I mean, you know, okay, so for playback on the Mac, uh, there's Amara, Pure Music, Bit Perfect, Ottervana, um, let's see, Decibel, Fidelia. Um, I've always wondered what. I always wonder what this would look like on a big screen, because <laughs> you can you can make this one so big. You can go large. Whoa, <laughs> that'd be so cool. Um, so let's go. Yeah, smaller, beautiful. Um, what I recommend, just download them all and try them. It's free to use for a while. The thing that you want to do is you won't want to use iTunes only. Right, right, right. And for me, the main reason is the auto sample rate switching. It can't do it. So if you play 16441, a CD ripped, fine. You go to a download from HG Tracks, 2496. iTunes cannot handle that. So it's set at the sample rate that it opened at. So, if you use a third-party player like Pure Music on top of iTunes, can you rip in non-Apple Apple format? No, you're still that. That's only playback for those apps. Inputting is still through iTunes. So you know what's kind of cool about this Fidelia app too is they have a an iPhone control app. It's a really small kind of minimalist interface. So, but I, it's like, just download it, give it a shot. What you like, you like. It's kind of like, you know, you like Picasso, I like Rembrandt. It's two ways to get there, you know? So, all right, yes? In that, that scenario you just painted there with the Mac Mini and the uh, FireWire storage, what would you do for redundancy in that, or backup both? Because... Yeah, yeah. Question is, what about redundancy or backup for the files? So. You, you have to have a backup of your music. The biggest, the biggest thing is your time. That's the, that's the big investment. You, know, you could buy all your CDs again. Granted, who would want to do that? 
but the hours you put into ripping is crazy. So um, on a Mac, I would use a program called Super Duper and just get another hard drive that's identical, connect it, and you can set up Super Duper just to copy it right over. Behind the scenes, you don't do anything. It's a mirror, exactly. And Super Duper is also cool because you can mirror the operating system drive and you can reboot and boot up to that external drive. I mean, back in like Windows XP in 95 days, that was space age stuff, you know? So it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, that's one way to do it. And then of course you could go the next step and then bring that hard drive to work or something so it's offsite, but you know, little pieces at a time. But that's what I would do. Yes? I just thought your ripping strategy was a really great post that I read a couple of years ago. Thanks. And it addressed a lot of the questions that have just come up. If you actually go in and read that one, I thought it was the best approach I'd ever read on how to rip. Thank you. And it included the redundancy piece that to me was future proof, meaning whether I want to you know look at it, uh, listen to an AI FM today or a wave tomorrow or a flack the next day, it gave me all of those options. So by just using that in its exact I just followed it precisely. It took about a half hour to set up the DB power amp. And I ripped twelve hundred CDs over the next year. And that strategy has proven to be great. I never thought I was gonna want flack, but then I got a squeeze box. Better with flat, so. Yeah, that so kind of redundancy was really great. Yeah, it kind of brings up the question, you know, what file format do I rip in? That one is like everybody asks that because who wants to rip 2,000 CDs in the wrong format? You know, <laughs> whatever. So, so I wrote the article, you know, my ripping strategy and methodology. It's quite lengthy, and there's a lot of things that are kind of over the top nuts, neurotic audio file type. So. I recommend, you know, read it, just take the bits and pieces you want. But I always think of it this way, is whatever you're using now, file format, playback application, that's gonna change. So set yourself up for success using a format that you can go to another format with. So for me, I love FLAC. It supports metadata, awesome. And from a FLAC file, I can get to any other format I want to very easily. And the metadata is all gonna be there as long as the file format I'm going to supports metadata. So say if you rip all to wave, and then you wanna to go to FLAC, oh, you're gonna to have to enter a lot of data in. So um, to, it's, it's too bad iTunes doesn't support FLAC on the Mac. But, but pure music, you can take FLAC files and put it into your iTunes library. Yes. Yes, so he's saying in pure music, you can play FLAC files, um, and some people do that. It's inconvenient for me. I don't like to do it. So um, that's just where I come from with my thing, but a lot of people do like it. Um, so yeah, it, file formats, you know, now that Apple lossless is uh, open and not just a proprietary Apple thing, I think that's a pretty good format. Um, uh, so, you know, if you're Mac only, ripping to Apple also, so it's got pretty good metadata and that'll probably get you where you're going. The one, one issue with Apple lossless is converting to other formats. Some converters have a problem with the bit depth and the word length if it's 16-bit or 24-bit. Um, it'll truncate 24-bit to 16-bit, um, so sometimes you got to go to AIFF instead. That's kind of a hassle, so if you're on PC, FLAC. No problems at all. So, yes? What, or is the output of all the FLAC players the same, or is it just the quality of music software? The software FLAC players? Uh, that's just like cables in the, <laughs> in the audio file industry. Um, everyone, will, not everyone, many people will say every single application sounds different and every configuration change within every application sounds different. Um, so that's why I just say they're free to try. Which one do you use primarily? Primarily, uh, let's see. Um, I use, it depends on what kind of mood I'm in. Um, yeah, if I want, this Otterbana program on Mac is really, really cool. Um, hang on, oh, it doesn't see it. So this, uh, real quick, I'll cover this one. Ottervana program, it'll do DSD over USB. It can handle a whole bunch of stuff. You can do all the exclusive mode, direct mode, whatever you want to try or get geeky with, or don't get geeky at all. 
it'll do it. Interface is very simplistic. Um, it's not, you know, the height of live and it's not the Cadillac. Or do we say Cadillac anymore? Or is it more like it's not the Bentley, you know? Um, so that's one I'll use if I don't want to use iTunes and Amara or Pure Music or whatever. Um, on the PC, I only use J River. Yeah, J River Media Center. And I'm not saying that because Matt's here. Um, it's, it's what I use. I, there's nothing out there that beats it, in my opinion. So there's no reason to look further. Um, it does, if you can think of it, it can probably do it. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I'll email the guys at J River and go, it'd be so cool if your application could do this. And then they just get instructions back. <laughs> okay, here's how you do it. Or here's the link to our site. Duh. So there was, yes? So to be clear, you're saying on the PC, to rip CDs to FLAC, use JRiver, period. Uh, I didn't say that. <laughs> um, here's how I do it. That route is excellent. Rip FLAC using JRiver. Single interface, single application. And you can convert them over to Apple Wasplus to put in iTunes. Yeah, 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 if you want. Simple, yeah. straightforward way to do it. Very simple, very straightforward. I go a little bit geekier. Um, for ripping, I like um, DB Power Amp. So I use a separate application for ripping. DB? Yeah, yeah. And a couple of reasons I do that is most people could care less about this, but I'll tell you why I do it. Um, so for each rip, it outputs a file for me, a text file, in the same folder as all the music that tells me how the rip went. Like if there was a problem, it's just in there. So if I'm listening to Isaac Hayes two years from now and I hear some tick or pop, I get the audio file freak out, oh my gosh, what is that, you know? So if I want, I can browse to that folder and go, oh yeah, 19 seconds in, there was a problem when it ripped that. I don't check it after every rip, but if I want, it's there. Not that I read it often, but it's there. And I also like the accurate rip database checking that it does. Um, so it'll rip your file, give it a unique identifier, not very unique, and then compare that rip to other people using the program, how their rips went. So, Granted, if everybody rips it imperfect, you got a perfectly imperfect file, but chances are pretty low of that. So, and maybe J River does all of this and I don't know it. <laughs> does J River output a text file? Uh, yeah, you, that's secure ripping and you can save the log file. Oh, strike one. Um, okay, so hang on, there was, uh, Yes? What media player do Linux servers use? Okay, most Linux servers use what's called MPD, Music Player Daemon, and you never have to know that, because you, as an end user of it, you could care less. Doesn't matter, you don't, okay, you interface with it, but you don't really know that. So, for a user interface, most of them are using MPOD, M-P-O-D, or MPAD, M-P-A-D. It's just the I iPhone or iPod application versus the iPad application. And it's, it's pretty good. It's gotten a lot better over the years. Um, it's got the you know, press and hold, and it comes up with other options, and cover art, and swiping around, and doing this and that. It's pretty cool. Um, the, so that brings up the other, another topic of kind of Linux servers. And, Linux is extremely scary for people who aren't geeks, um, but you don't, you can, if you use a Linux server, it doesn't matter to you because you never interface with it. It runs like an appliance. Like, you know, chances are your refrigerator is running some sort of code. Do you care what code that is? No. So the Linux servers, like say, a render, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that one. Um, it's really, really neat. Pull that up. Yeah, it's not cheap. Um, so that's so that's the render server. It runs Linux, um, and so what the, the what the Idea Lab, the company did, 
is they don't use MPAD or MPOD, the kind of free application. They develop their own application for interfacing with it. Very, very nice. Most companies with Linux servers use the freely available apps, MPAD, MPOD, stuff like that. So if you don't want to mess around with Mac or uh, Windows or worry about outputting bit perfect data and sample rate changes or anything like that, try the Linux route. There's some very affordable Linux servers. Probably, gosh, you probably get one for 600, 700 bucks. Um, and same interface as one that's 5,000 bucks if they're using MPD and MPAD. Um, it's a great way to start and you don't have to know anything about it. A lot of them will, you throw the CD in, it rips it and spits it out. So pretty easy to use. Yes? You mentioned cables. Uh, seems the cable companies are now beginning to target PC audio. It's the biggest growing market. Audio Ethernet cables, uh, audio grade USB and firewire cables. Do you have a feeling about them? No. <laughs> <laughs> Next. No uh, comment or? Question was about USB cables, Ethernet cables, um, and the audiophile cable companies targeting that market and the products that they offer. Okay, just, just really for you, one more plug about PP Power, but I'm not sure that you mentioned is the power of its um, metadata grabber, of its data grabber, because it, it leverages five separate databases and then compares for errors between all of them when it's compiling the metadata for what you're ripping. And I don't think there's anything equivalent to that. The, the, just the amount of time that saved me. Yeah. Um, for an album, old album I have that I don't know if the tracks are right. It, it found a lot of errors I never would have found. Yeah. What? As you know, an audio file. I, of course, I have all the weird releases, the XRCD. You know, this and that. And yeah, a lot of times it can find it, but I end up putting a lot of my own cover art in because if you have three versions of Kind of Blue. When you are on a music server, you don't, you, know, you don't have the case to see, oh, what version is this? And that's a big deal. You know, what remaster is this? So I'll get the exact cover art and put it in there. So it's... But the beauty of it is, but it will find, as you know, it will find that and give you a dozen options. From the yeah, it finds a lot of it, and you can hit, you know, show me all the options you found. So it's, it's a powerful tool. Yes. Next. Yes. I know nothing about it. Let's, let's go here. Chris, I, I've got some albums I want to convert to uh, iTunes. Okay, so the question is about what's the best way to get vinyl to digital into iTunes or whatever. Um, there's no best way to do it. I have a writer right now working on um, a Windows and a Mac article on A to D. So I'll publish shortly the PC one, and then following that, probably a month later, I'll have one for Mac. But what a lot of the other people are using is like Peer Music on their Mac, or um, Amara Vinyl. Uh, those are paid for applications. On the PC, a lot of people are using Audacity. It's free. So your A to D converter makes a humongous difference. Um, don't use a turntable with a USB uh, output. <laughs> oh, you bought one. Oh, no. <laughs> um, use one if you would like. <laughs> it's not the height of living. I, you know, it's, you're ripping your vinyl once. Do you want it to sound like that turntable? <laughs> so, you know. Um, uh, Peer Music is, is one app. Do you use Mac or PC? PC? Uh, Audacity is a free one. Yeah, and it has a lot of setup uh, options. And you can even do software, R R I A. -A. So are there any special turntables? No, no, no. Use, you know, do you have a turntable? Or, yeah, use like your good turntable. I mean, that's, yeah. <laughs> Next, yes. You had a, a third party or another person doing interviews or reviews on your website, but I haven't seen anything from her lately. Kathy? 
Oh, yes, she is still around, but she had some. All right, we're good. Uh, her mother passed away, and she's just been kind of taking care of personal things. So, But yes, she's still around. Oh, yes, definitely. Very creative person. Very, uh, she's coming from a totally different place than audiophiles. So it's really interesting to hear what she has to say. Yes? I'm also a complete newbie. So at the end of the process, you got to get it into the preamp somehow, right? If you use a preamp, yes. Uh, that's, that's how my system set up. Okay, okay mine too. Um, so, what, how does that work? What's, what's the, the alternative there? Okay, the ultimate inexpensive route is to use a mini to RCA cable from your computer, analog out into your preamp. I would never do that, but it's a way to do it. Uh, how I frequently do it is get a DAC, digital to analog converter, that's got USB input. So I'll connect a single USB cable from my computer to the DAC. And then from the DAC, it's just your straight out audio file stuff, RCA cables into your preamp. So it's, it's pretty, pretty simple. But if you haven't done it before, it's like rocket science. So when I look at analog and vinyl, that's rocket science to me. I am totally lost. I couldn't do it to save my life. So um, are you from the area here? Go, you know, go to Listen Up or one of the dealers. Just, they'll show you how, it, how it's done, and then you'll go, uh, that's simple. And then do your research, and, you know. So it's, it's pretty easy. Are there any choices in terms of uh, interconnect between the DAC and the... Oh, yes. Tons of choices. No single method is better than the others. But, I mean, USB, FireWire, um, it's probably one Pro Thunderbolt model out, um, or Ethernet is another route to go. It all... It kind of comes down to how you want to use your system. Yeah, I guess I'm talking about the other way, though, the interconnect out of the DAC into the preamp. Out of the DAC into the preamp, that's always just going to be an analog interconnect. Because if it's a DAC, it's coming out analog. So it's no biggie. Um, other people are using, you know, carrying a digital all the way to their speakers now and stuff like that, but that's a totally another story. Uh, the other gentleman was uh, on disparaging USB, I think, in, in favor of Ethernet, and I gather you're not so... No, I, I would never do that. Um, because I've had USB DACs that sound terrible, way worse than Ethernet DAC, and vice versa. It all comes down to implementation. You can buy a chip off the shelf for Ethernet, throw that in your deck and call it a day. And it may be terrible. And the same goes for USB. You really got to, you know, do some research, give it a listen. If you like it, if it's good to you, it's good. So... Is there a length consideration? Would, could you run a USB cable longer than an Ethernet cable? Oh, definitely not. USB, I think, is capped at five meters. Or, yeah, five meters. And here's the thing, too. Some manufacturers are selling USB cables longer than the USB spec, and there's no way around it that's out of the spec, and there's something called like round trip time or return, tri return time. Um, so if a packet is sent, it has to get back to the sender from the receiver in a certain amount of time, and past a certain distance, it can't do that. Granted, you're still gonna get audio, it's still gonna work, but it's outside of the spec, so just be warned there. Ethernet cable, I think, is 100 meters. Um, Cat five or six for two hundred. I think I thought it was a hundred meters. Anyway, it's quite long. If it's a hundred meters, then you need it. You can also extend that by using a switch. So, Ethernet gets rid of a lot of uh, space concerns. I only use Wi-Fi for the remote control part of it. I wouldn't pull files over Wi-Fi because it's slow. Uh, they may say, you know, this is 300 megabit Wi-Fi. Okay, go for it. But chances are you won't be happy with it. I've never been that way. So, but give it a shot if you got it. Yes? Uh, so what, what, what's the benefit of using a DAC over just using, like, taking a, a toss cable from your Mac into the back of your receiver? 
is it just it's a better converter in the DAC than would be in my receiver? Not necessarily, because your receiver has the built-in DAC. Yeah. So yeah, the question is, what if I just take Toslink out of my MacBook into my receiver or a dedicated DAC? It goes both ways. Some external DACs will totally surpass what your receiver is capable of, and vice versa. All depends on your receiver, how it's implemented. So yeah, don't believe any hype about external DAC is the, the way to go. It's not always the case. Yes? I'm probably about to speak some heresy here at this show, but uh, I'm using a multi-channel sound call. Uh, Excellent. Uh, right now, because my system serves dual purposes. So it's home theater and, um, and two channel. Like and many, and, or yep. Or multi-channel music too. So um, a problem is developed with the Carsey HT Omega um, uh, Halo XT. Um, nice sounding when it works. I'm using my thing. I'm using the computer directly as a pre-pro in, in, in essence. Um, hopefully the problem can be fixed. It's not something fundamental to the card. But playing devil's advocate, if I have to get a new card, are you aware of any other multi-channel cards, either internal? Not off the top of my head. It's been a while since I looked at multi-channel. Yeah, then it's yeah. It'd be a disservice if I gave an answer because it'd probably be not a good one. Who's up? If you're thinking the question, chances are other people got it too. Yes. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Playing from memory is slower for me, so I get annoyed. I mean, talk about first world problem. I mean, the quarter of a second it takes to buffer that track into memory. Oh, gosh. You know, <laughs> what are we going to do? Um, but I don't know. I, I would bet money I could never tell the difference in some sort of blind test. Um, so, but... Usually it's a free option to enable and give it a shot yourself, you know. If you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. Oh, well. Yes? You mentioned the value of uh, reports from your RIPs. And for, for a Mac user, I think XLD does that fairly well. Do you have thoughts on XLD? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, XLD is another ripping program that you can use on a Mac, and it will output reports. Um, I don't know if I have any of those on here just to show you what they look like. No, I don't have any on here. Um, XLD, is a, it's a pretty good ripper. I, I don't think it's as powerful, though, as the PC solutions in terms of metadata and ease of use. Um, and I guess maybe as a ripper it is, but as a batch converter, Works great, but I have run into weird quirks like, okay, if I convert this folder of FLAC to Apple Lossless, I want to bring over the PDF too. Don't convert it, but just copy it in the process or move that text file over, move folder.jpg over some, and XLD is a little short on those kind of features. But as a ripper, yeah, it's, it's good. I like it. And if you have like this laptop, gosh, it's got like eight CPU cores or something, and if you... Use Excel. Here, I'll do it. It's, I mean, it is so fast. Oh, update. I will right, skip. Um, so I'll just show you XLD. So let's take, uh, I don't know this many files. It's kind of cool. You just drag it down to the XLD icon. This could be scary because I don't know where they're going. I haven't looked at the output. So, oh, it's not writable. I was probably uh, doing something crazy. Specify. Oh, I had a folder called Wave. Let's just throw them at the desktop. That's odd.
So I'm going to take this whole folder of review music, just drag it down to XLD, and it's going to convert it all. And if you've got eight cores, look at it, it just cruises. I mean, so start with if your library is all flack and then, oh, I want to move to wave for some weird reason, you could just take your whole music folder, throw it to XLD, and then walk away. Whether this is 50 songs or 50,000 CDs, we'll just go. So really powerful stuff. Oh, I think I had it set it. Yeah, it's wave. Just not that I'm doing any recommendations or anything, but just for illustrative purposes. Who's up? We got 25 minutes. Oh, boy. Yes? Yep. Yes, we briefly touched on it right away. Uh, Caps version three, working on it right now. Uh, I I don't have a date. Could be a month. Could be two months. Could be four. Just because some of the parts I'm waiting on haven't been released yet, so it's like specs have been out, you can see the boards, but they're not available. So I'm just waiting on some of those. So Oh yeah, it'll be fully published and there'll be probably three versions of it. So yes, in the back. You. <laughs> so if you have rip files, you're happy with rips, but you're not happy with metadata and you're on a Mac, what application do you recommend that gives the most flexibility to go in and modify the metadata? Assuming you've got like flash or something that Oh that's a tough one. Uh, it would be great if there was just some great metadata editor. You know, there's I think there's one called like MP3 edit or something like that. MP3 is in the name. It doesn't have to be an MP3 file. Um, some people are using that. I always end up using, for metadata editing now, I'm using JRiver on PC. I do my best with the rip to get the metadata in there, but when there's something else I want, it, the file's going to JRiver anyway, so then I'll just start editing the met metadata there. It's it's tough on a Mac. No, no. That's my experience too, which is why. <laughs> yeah, and another frustrating thing too is rips with Apple, the album art. If you rip it with iTunes, it's not getting embedded into the file, as you know. <laughs> so, yes. When you're using JRiver on a PC, uh, do you care if it's a flag or a wave file being played back? I mean, do you have a preference? No. It doesn't matter to you either way. No. Doesn't matter. In terms of sound, doesn't matter. Yeah. Metadata, big time, it matters to me. But. Do you prefer flag? Oh, gosh, yes. I hate wave files for metadata. Disastrous. Again, with Linux, how do you edit metadata? Okay, with Linux, uh, how do you edit metadata? few ways to do it. Some music servers, uh, Daniel Weiss has a music server called The Man 301. You can edit right from the iPad app. It's not the easiest if you want to do mass editing, but it's kind of cool. You're browsing your library and, oh shoot, I misspelled this name. You just edit it right from your chair. Um, otherwise, for Linux servers, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll rip using DB Power Ramp edit it elsewhere, and then import it into the Linux server. Or you can rip right onto the Linux server, the kind where you put the CD in. It rips it and spits it out, and then just open it up via network share and edit it that way. Yes? I'm kind of new to this all, and I have three systems in my house. So what I'm trying to do is get um, all, all three systems playing at the same time. So, Same music? Yeah. Okay. I was up in a VAR room, and I like the VAR art. So basically, I have to buy three DAC minis, download the VAR to each, and then um, I send the information, like an Apple and Airport Express, that send the, just the information for all the Mac minis to play at the same time. Okay. Sure, sure. Okay, so noth uh, there's nothing available here. So to send the same music to three different locations... Throughout the house, here's what I would do uh, on a Mac. Use iTunes, get airport expresses for each of those locations. And then within iTunes, you can pull up, 
usually there's a button right down here at the bottom. If there's any airport expresses available, they show up. Um, and you can select all of them, a few of them, none of them. But that's not going to give me high resolution if I just use that, right? Correct. That's only going to give you 44.1. If you want to distribute high resolution to several systems, then that's a whole other ballgame. How about three back minutes? You won't get... Uh, It'll be very tough to synchronize the audio because what you want to do is send it from one computer to the other devices. So high resolution. Squeeze box saves don't they? Squeeze box. If you have three squeeze boxes, I think you can sync it all. You can probably do it. It might get geeky. Um, yeah, you won't get the iTunes interface or anything like that, or you won't use Amara. Um, on, on the PC side, it's a different story, but for Mac, it's Airport Express works every time. It's just not high res. And I, I, I probably won't use the right terminology, but I'm not trying to send the, the actual high resolution data, right? I'm just sending the three Mac things to play that, so the, that songs that it's already high resolution. Play them locally? On the Mac things. Yeah. You want to control three libraries at the same time? Ooh, I don't know how to do it. Nope. Are you always going to be playing the same song simultaneously? Yes. You don't need three servers. It sounds like you need a hardware solution that keeps the cable sync. That sounds like a much simpler route. So basically, you need one player, one server, one stream, but three sets. You need to duplicate the signal three times. The problem is the high res. Yeah. yeah. So, so, but if you find one high res solution, you need that. You need some type of way. Sonos doesn't do high res either. It's an awesome system for ease of use, but no high res. Yes. You said in the past that you don't like the DAC magic, but have you considered reviewing the DAC magic clause? No. Not that I don't like it. There's just a lot of other stuff out there. I mean, I'm backed up right now for months with other stuff in to review. So just a lot of things. Yes? A couple of basic questions. One is uh, uh, when you are actually ripping all your Brazilian CDs, what's your experience on whatever the devices that you're using, the quality of the device affecting the outcome of the bit stream? The quality of the CD drive? Personally, I've never found a difference in any of them. Because to me, if I rip the file off two different spinning CD drives, and that file has the same checksum on the hard drive, to me, that's identical file. As long as the, you don't have the bit errors because it scratches. Yeah, that yeah that that would be a good reason to use a different drive. If your CDs are pretty scratched, then there are definitely drives that outperform the others um, in terms of speed or the ability to read what's scratched. So, but yeah, I've never done a real good survey of those. I'm sure one of the follow. Just on the user interfaces that we've seen on, on your screen and, and around on various vendors here, mm -hmm. um, a lot of people start off with iTunes and then overlay things versus like the J-River. I happen to be PC-based. I was just curious about, given your, your tons of experience, uh, what defines a really great user interface for you? And which, how do you pick and choose? Can you modify something for better presentation of the album or uh, going after a particular uh, type of music like I want to listen to uh, for CD operas or something. Yeah. Um, for me versus, see, I'm not, I mean, I like some classical, I like some opera, but it's not my main thing. And so my needs are very different than a lot of other people. That was an example. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, Tuning your, your interface. Okay. Your what constitutes a, a really good interface or what do I look for and stuff like that? Um, to me, a absolutely fabulous interface is Sulu's. For the metadata and what you can get out of that, 
I haven't seen anything better. It, I mean, if you're browsing it, you select an album, um, say, John Hyatt, Bring the Family, it will tell you who produced it, who mastered it, and then say, oh, what else has this person mastered? You can get to that. I mean, you can jump all over. So Sulu's that way. S-O-O-L-O-O-S. It is just, it's an amazing interface. It's not cheap, like everything in this hobby. It's, uh, Sulus was the original company name when they started it, and then Meridian bought it. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great system. They have much cheaper versions now, like, like an M200 or MC200 or something. It's smaller. The library, the drive internally is much smaller. Big one goes for 7500 Yeah, the 7, would be a start for a regular size one. Um, so it's not most inexpensive. But getting back to the question, so what I look for in an interface is um, I want to tell the technology what to do. I don't like the technology to tell me how to listen to my music. So from an interface, I want to be able to browse however I browse. If I want to do artist, album, however I feel like it, and then... I want to say, oh, this album, I want to play next, or I want to play it after, so I can just select, play this after every other album that's on there now. Like the iTunes remote interface, you can't do that. So if I want to hear something after the current album, I got to browse back to it when the album is done and then press play. To me, that is not a good interface. I hate it. So like J Remote, it allows the user to pretty much tell it what you want it to do. And to me, that's like everything. Um, so, and it's, so like the new, oh yeah, the, like the new iPads and everything have the retina display. J remote is fully compatible. The album art in it is very high resolution. As long as you provide high resolution album art in your library and the icons in J remote, granted it's a little teeny detail, but they're very high resolution. It's, it's a great user experience in terms of here's how I want to listen to music. Now technology do it my way type of thing. So that's really what I look for, and the ability to set up things when I want to set them up. I want to listen to this album next or at the end, and then not have to go back. What does J Remote cost? J Remote's probably 10 bucks. I mean, so free in this hobby? Yeah. Yes? Oh, no worries. Um, there will be sound differences. The, they both function quite differently and have different audio interfaces, whereas the Mac Mini doesn't really have an internal audio interface that you'll use. You'll go output to, say, a USB DAC or something. Sulu's devices come with, like, a digital audio out or with a DAC built in. There's all kinds of configurations. Somebody's probably using it here. Y it can, yeah. So... Yeah, very different though in terms of the Sulus. It, it's going to run. You, it actually runs on like Windows embedded, um, but it works. And if a drive fails, it notifies your dealer, and your dealer calls you, brings a new drive. It's it's kind of the full service solution for if you just want to listen to music, you want great metadata, and don't want to screw around with anything. So. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes? If I have three different systems, so I have buy three different Sulus? You, okay, Sulus has a bunch of different devices, control points, and a bunch of different devices. So you usually there's one main disk storage, and then there's different other places you'd send audio out to. So there's probably a Sulus dealer here, much more versed, well-versed than I am in it. I love it. It's a great product. I would check it out. Yes? Yeah, that one comes up a lot. Somebody asked me like yesterday, a Mac Mini versus a Mac Pro or a MacBook Pro. Um, if you're going to the Mac route, which one to use? Um, I would steer clear of the Mac Pro. I have one. 
it's a noisy beast. It's, I mean, it's the big workstation, um, and I just uh, steer clear of it. It's noisy electrically. It's noisy. Uh, it's got fans in it spinning. Granted, they're pretty silent for what they are, but it's still spinning, and it could bug you. So it comes down for me between a Mac Mini and a MacBook Pro. Um, I prefer a MacBook Pro because if I run a Mac Mini, I'm going to do it without a keyboard, without a monitor connected, and I'm just going to put it in the audio system. If I need that, I'm going to have to run and get the monitor and plug it in because I don't want the monitor to be in my audio system. Versus if I get the MacBook Pro, I have a monitor built in when I need it. I run to it, I flip it up, and I do whatever I want to do, and I'm done. And if you want to get, you know, totally audiophile, you can run it off batteries. So that's just the way I, I mean, it's not black and white major differences, but that's kind of the logic I use when I select it. Yes? So the simple solution to that, um, I use the iPad, it's just PNC. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Splash Top VNC. There's yeah. There's a bunch of remote control apps that you can get to the actual interface, the OSX interface on it. Definitely. Yes, in the back. Yeah, yeah. Good question. Uh, he's asking what kind of resolution do you get for streaming audio from like Mog? Mog is like. I can't live without Mog. Um, if you don't know what it is, it's a streaming music service. Um, I there's a different levels, but the high level is like ten bucks a month. So I pay ten bucks a month. I could stream virtually any music I can think of to my iPhone, to my computer. Um, the day the new releases come out, boom, I have them on my iPhone. I download them to my iPhone, so I listen to them in the airplane. I have twenty gig worth of music in my iPhone right now from Mog. The resolution is MP3. It's 320K. That's as high as they go, the high as, as high as any streaming service will go. Um, I use it more for music discovery than anything else. New releases come out. I got them. I'll listen to them. Do I want to buy it? Yes. Amazon or the local store and get it. So taking chances on albums because the album cover looks kind of cool is kind of out the window. You don't need to do it anymore. But yeah, it's MP3, but to me, it allows me to listen to it for a little bit. I'm all in. It's awesome. I love Mog. Yes? Bypassing the power lead on a firewire cable to a RAID array, right? Nine pin to like four pin or and then back. Um, you asked for my opinion, so I'll give it. I think there's far bigger fish to fry, and I don't know what it would do. I don't know. I mean, it, I suppose if your RAID array could inject a bunch of noise into your computer, I don't know. But it I mean, it doesn't hurt to do it, you know. What's it cost? Five bucks. So, in this hobby, five bucks. Whew. Do you have any experience with a server company called Betas? I have no experience with that. I just saw the website like two weeks ago for the first time. So, no experience. Looks similar to the CAP server. What about Wired for Sound? Wired for Sound? What about them? They have, yeah, Wired for Sound has a server. I think it runs Vortex Box. Yeah, that's a great solution. It's Linux. It's like a toaster. Put CDs in, it rips, spits them out. You're playing music. Yep, rips them into FLAC. You can mirror it into other formats, and it uses MPAD probably for control or MPOD. Yeah, those servers are great. Yeah, or Logitech. It can, I think it can feed Sonos too. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yes. Do you see any, uh, any real major changes on the horizon with DACs? It seems to be one of the things that's in flux every year. Uh, do you have any advanced knowledge? Not, not, I'm not talking about no, under two years. No. Just do you have a sense of where it's going? 
Um, I don't know. It seems like I don't see too many changes other than uh, engineering perfections and stuff. I mean, I don't, I don't see like some other format coming out that's going to be totally different than Thunderbolt, USB, anything like that. So if you buy a DAC today and next year, you're SOL. None of that. Um, DSD, capability. DSD capability is the only new thing recently. So DSD over USB. That's kind of new. If you have DSD content, it's cool. If you don't, you could care less about it. And like everything else in this industry, it's people debate whether how can you make a DAC that's optimized for DSD and PCM. You know, just debate forever. But I have a few DSD uh, rips, and I totally love it. It's great. Um, and if, if you're not familiar with how it does it, it's quite cool. So DSD over USB, uh, when you play it back, the it makes it look like 24176 PCM, but it's really DSD. So the way that they did it, it's very cool. Matt knows quite a bit about it. Um, Oh, yes, 4 o'clock? 4 o'clock, there's a panel on it. Excellent. Yeah, it's really cool. I love it, but it really, it all comes down to content, too. If you don't have DSD, who cares? So, but I, I really don't see that many changes. What is DSD? Direct Stream Digital. It's the Super Audio CD. That's what's on a Super Audio CD. S-A-C-D. So, chances are, you could care less about DSD on a DAC like a lot of other people. <laughs> Anyone else? Got a, f ooh, we got four minutes. Can we do it? Confused? Let's clear, oh, seriously. What are you confused about? Let's clear it up, if we can, because so are other people. If you can think of questions. Well, you answered my basic question. Sure. And uh, then there seems to be so much more after that. Uh, yep. All these, um, Software is like your J-River and yep. uh, uh, Pure. And yeah, so all the other things. Just try to have a narrow focus. Set your goal. Have a somewhat narrow focus because so many other things won't matter to you. So, you know, you said, here's what I want to do. What, how do I get there? So, you know, iTunes, FireWire Drive, whatever. Go down that road, and chances are that's all you'll have to do. If you get crazy with it, okay, maybe try something else. But you don't have to know. I mean, you don't have to know about peer music. I mean, whoopee, there's other applications that do the same thing or don't use any. I mean, which one's probably the easiest for a non geek like me to use? For a non geek, there's yeah, an app. I'm a non geek, right? I don't, <laughs> I don't even carry a cell phone. Sure. Oh, oh, that would be so cool. I envy you. Oh, I run my company from my pocket. Oh. So there's a program called BitPerfect. It's like five bucks. You launch it once, that's it. It runs in the background. Then you can just use iTunes, and it'll change the sample rates for you on the fly. Do all that. Five bucks, run it in the background. If that does it for you, awesome. You just spend five bucks, and you're done. So... Start cheap. Don't worry about all the other stuff. Because as soon as you figure out all the other stuff, there's way more other stuff. The more you know, the more you know you don't know. Yeah? Well, I'm repeating, but did you say if you had a network server, you don't want to use a wireless solution? For a net, yeah, if you have like network attached storage or if you have a DLNA DAC or anything, I hate wireless for that. I just, I think the performance is terrible. No matter what the specs on it say, I, I hate it. So I just use wired Ethernet. But for remote control, I use wireless constantly. And you know, for as picky as audio files are about small details, it's crazy how much RF is in every single room here with everybody's iPhone and wireless. And I would never do that. OK, whatever. So we have one minute. Yes? So I have my three systems. There's no answer to that. Yeah, there really isn't. 
You can put little Linux boxes there, same price. I mean, could go on and on. Oh, yeah, very high quality, yeah. Probably like 20 seconds left. There was one more question. Uh, for classical music on a Mac, is there any interface that works better for that? Oh, there is a development coming for that. Um, the question is classical music on the Mac, uh, good interface for it because iTunes has such limited metadata. Something is coming that will improve iTunes for metadata, specifically for classical music. So hopefully within, before CES. So, all right, we're out of time. Thank you very much, people. I'll be here until they kick me out in the back, probably.